In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Today is the first Friday of August 2024. I would like to thank the young men who have stayed over for a whole week to to help finish the future sacristy, which is the adjacent room here. And they have been uh, stripping off the old lumber and putting up drywall and and then the joint composite and then the new floor and insulation and soon paint and soon it will be all over and we can have the sacristy right here which will be very convenient for the altar and for the mass and this will be heated probably by wood stove so pray for the boys who have generously helped in this from throughout the U.S. and from Canada. On this feast day today, which is also August the 2nd, it's the feast of St. Alphonsus Liguri. And St. Alphonsus, he's one of those champion fathers of the church. He's not a father, sorry, he's a doctor of the church. And one of the great founders of the Redemptorist Order, which was an order of priests who were specifically to preach the Catholic faith and specifically missions, to preach parish missions. So that's what the Redemptorists did. They would go to parish to parish, preaching for a few days or for a week, and at night hearing confessions, and people would line up in long lines to go to confession. Normally in the missions, the the priests would preach usually about the love of God, the horrors of sin, how serious sin is, what it means to offend God, what means eternal fire, the, the punishment for mortal sin, even one, the horrors of hell, and that they are eternal, they will never end. And also the pains of purgatory, how we must pray for the souls in purgatory. St. Alphonsus, in his great sermons, they are always so rich, so beautiful, so powerful. And St. Alphonsus has written voluminously on many subjects, on the Incarnation. One of his highlight works is the glories of Mary. All praise and honor of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And he draws always from sacred scripture. And he shows how the sacred scripture teaches the seven sacraments, teaches veneration of the most blessed Virgin Mary. The sacred scripture teaches the most holy trinity. All that we hold in the Catholic faith is expressed in the scriptures. Most of it is explicit, some of it is implicit, but it's all there. And for the Protestants and the heretics, they always say, well, if it doesn't say it explicitly, I don't believe it. Well, God has his wisdom and he has his ways of speaking to us in the sacred scripture and tradition. And if he wishes to speak explicitly, we believe. If God wishes to speak implicitly what we must believe, we believe simply. We cannot say Lord, I believe you when you speak explicitly, but not when you speak implicitly. That's an insult to the wisdom of God. Because there's a, there's a reason why God will, ex, will express things explicitly and, and implicitly. And what's the beauty of the great fathers of the church and the doctors of the church is that they pull out all the Catholic teaching that's implicitly in sacred scripture. One little example it says in Ecclesiasticus chapter 44 about, it speaks of the garden enclosed and there's no doors to this garden. No, no man, it says, no man has access to the interior of this garden which is walled off with four walls. Yet there's no window, there's no gate, there's no door. 
Yet this garden is beautiful, it has no weeds, and it produces flowers and fruits. So what is the Book of Wisdom speaking of? And literally, you would say, well, he's just talking about a garden with four walls and it bears a lot of fruits. Yes, that's true. That's the literal meaning. But the Holy Ghost and Almighty God is far wiser than any of us. And when he speaks of this, he's, he's implicitly speaking of the virginity of the Blessed Virgin Mary. She is the garden enclosed that is beloved by the, the farmer, which is the Heavenly Father. And there's no doors to this garden because no man can enter in. And that is the perpetual virginity of the most blessed Virgin Mary. No man ever, ever trespassed her holy chastity, her holy purity. And St. Joseph had nothing but great veneration and love and a chaste love for the Blessed Virgin Mary. St. Joseph was all pure and chaste. The Blessed Virgin Mary was all pure and chaste. So that's just one example of the implicit meaning of Scripture. And it's the Holy Ghost when Christ promised to his Catholic Church, to the Pope and the bishops of the Catholic Church, that there are many truths that will be revealed as the Holy Ghost reveals them from the sacred scripture. Nothing is ever new, but is always made more clear. Again, another example, the Catholic Church and the Apostles always believed in the assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary body and soul into heaven. It was always be, been believed. And there's masses that were said for centuries on August 15th, for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And in Spain, they were allowed to have beautiful blue vestments for Our Lady that would they, they would wear on August 15th for centuries. So only in 1950 did Pope Pius XII proclaim this a dogma of the faith. It's not new. He's just making explicit and a dogma what was always believed by Catholics anyway. And now it's binding to be believed. It's nothing new, but it's made more explicit. And that's the Holy Ghost guiding the Catholic Church. And the Holy Ghost guides the Catholic Church also, <clears throat> not only in clarifying doctrine, but also condemning heresy and error. And the heresies and errors of our day that are taking many souls to hell is liberalism, socialism, communism, the modernism, which is all explained in detail by St. Pius X. Modernism is a wide spectrum of heresies and errors. St. Pius X called it the cesspool, the septic tank of all heresies. But part of it is those who promote separation of church and state. That's one of the modernist errors. Another angle is those who attack the miracles of sacred scripture and the historicity of scripture, especially of the book of Genesis and all the explanation of the flood of Noah. This is all history. It's history. It's literal. It's true. It really happened. And the modernists attack the, especially the book of Genesis and try to explain it away as just a bunch of myths, as myths stories, fables, and they attack even our Lord himself, his holy resurrection. They say it was not a physical resurrection, but only a spiritual resurgence in the hearts of the disciples, <laughs> which, which is pure subjectivism, and that's what modernism is based on. So, St. Alphonsus, he's a champion of the Catholic faith, and what's beautiful about, beautiful about all his writings is none of it is tainted with heresy or error or modernism. And he, he constantly quotes scripture. And here he is speaking about the love of God. Listen to what he says. 
By your ingratitude you deserve that, that he should call you no more to repentance. But our Lord has continued to invite you to return to him. And who is it that has called you? It is a God of infinite majesty who is to be one day your judge and on whom your eternal happiness or misery depends. And what are you but miserable worms deserving hell? Why has he called you? To restore you to the life of sanctifying grace which you have lost. Return you and live, Ezekiel chapter 18. Return you and live to acquire the grace of God. It would be but little to spend a hundred years in a desert in fasting and penitential austerities. But God offered it to you for a single act of sorrow and contrition. You refused that act, and after your refusal, he has not abandoned you, but has sought after you, saying, And why will you die, O house of Israel? Like a father weeping and following his son, who has voluntarily thrown himself into the sea, God has sought after you, saying through compassion to each of you, My son, why dost thou bring thyself to eternal misery? Why will you die, O house of Israel? And here he brings out a very tender touch of the most sacred heart of Jesus, very beautiful. He says, As a pigeon that seeks to take shelter in a tower, seeing the entrance closed on every side, it continues to fly around it till she finds an opening through which she enters. So says St. Augustine, so did the divine, merciful heart of Jesus act towards me when I was in enmity with God. The Lord treated you, brethren, in a similar manner. As often as you sinned, you banished him from your souls. The wicked have said to God, Depart from us. Job 21. <coughs> and instead of abandoning you, what has the Lord done? He has placed himself at the door of your ungrateful hearts and by his knocking has made you feel that he was outside and seeking for admission. Behold, I stand at the gate and knock. Apocalypse chapter 3. He, as it were, entreated you to have compassion on him and to allow him to enter. Open to me, my sister. Canticles chapter 5. Open to me. I will deliver you from perdition. I will forget all the insults you have offered to me if you give up sin. Perhaps you are unwilling to open to me through fear of becoming poor by restoring ill-gotten goods, that is, returning what was stolen, or by separating from a person who provided for you. Am not I, says the Lord, able to provide for you? Perhaps you think that if you renounce a certain sinful friendship which separates you from me, you shall lead in a life of misery. Am I not able to content your soul and make your life happy? Ask those who love me with their whole hearts, and they will tell you that my grace makes them content and that they would not exchange their condition, though poor and humble, for all the delights and riches of the monarchs of the earth. And then he brings out <clears throat> another point, how our Lord has called out to us My voice has grown hoarse, calling out to sinners. Weeping thou shalt not weep, he will surely have pity on thee. And that at the voice of thy cry, as soon as he, as he shall hear, he will answer thee. The moment he shall hear you say, Forgive me, O my God, forgive me, he will instantly answer and grant you pardon. So St. Alphonsus, you see his wisdom, and he, 
he moves the soul to the love of God. He moves the soul to contrition. He moves the soul to consider all the aspects of our Lord's life and especially his passion. So what a great work St. Alphonse is, and he has many works. Every house should have at least five books of St. Alphonse on their shelves and read them. This is why it's very important in a family that the parents monitor the use of internet and video games. They, they shouldn't be in a home, but if they have them, they should monitor them and make sure the children read. Many children simply do not read anymore. And that's why many will fall for the Antichrist because they just won't read. They fall for liberalism and errors because they just won't read. And they won't resist sin. They won't fight for the faith. Many fall away from the faith because they do not pray and they do not do spiritual reading. Here's how we sinners treat our Lord. Listen to these words. Oh, my Savior, on that first Holy Thursday evening, your thoughts were only of peace, charity, and goodwill from men, whereas we have had only malice and cruelty for you. You sought only to save us. We sought only to do away with thee. Your whole heart and your whole mind were bent on breaking the chains that held us bound as slaves of, of the devils. And we would sell you, betray you, and deliver you into the hands of your cruel enemies. You were preoccupied with establishing an adorable sacrament whereby always to abide with us in the most holy Eucharist. But we were striving to drive you far from the world, to banish you from off the earth, and even to destroy you if we could do so. You prepared for us on earth boundless graces, and in heaven thrones, magnificent and glorious crowns. If we were willing to render ourselves worthy of them. But we, us sinners, we were preparing for you ropes, whips, lashes, thorns, nails, lances, the cross, spit, revilings, blasphemies, and all sorts of shameful, outrageous cruelties. You set before us a most delectable feast of thy own body and blood, and we gave you gall and vinegar to drink. You gave us thy holy and immaculate body, and we bruised it by punches and kicks and blows. We cut it with our lashes of our sins. We pierced your sacred body in a thousand places with thorns and nails. We covered it with wounds from head to foot. We dismembered it on the cross, causing it to suffer the most atrocious tortures. And our Lord revealed to St. Bridget that there was well over 4,300 tortures and lacerations on Christ's bodies. The cuts that were light and cuts that were deep, over 4,000. Finally, my Savior, thou didst love us more than thy own life and blood, since you sacrificed yourself for us who were your enemies. But in return, by our sins, we ripped your soul from your sacred body by violence, by death. What goodness, what charity, what love flowing from thy adorable heart, O oh my Savior. What ingratitude, what wickedness, what cruelty stemming from the heart of man. And that is the real picture of sin. We have crucified our Lord, but he has only returned love and mercy. And as long as we're on this earth, his ocean of mercy is there to just jump in. 
And he's always ready to forgive, no matter how many or how great the sinners are. I remember in, I think it's, I think it's in Texas, there is a, off the highway, one of the main highways near Amarillo, there was a bunch of Protestants put together a whole life-size Stations of the Cross. And it's a Catholic devotion, and they don't believe in images, but here they have all the images of the Stations of the Cross. And it's very beautiful. And it ends with the crucifixion and there's also a, an image of the Shroud of Turin. All these are Catholic devotions. And the man who built that, he built it out of gratitude to our Lord and to inspire those people driving on the highway for a rest stop. They can come and get refreshments and then walk and see the passion of our Lord. And he told me that there was once, he came outside and he saw a man on his knees and he had a big suitcase with money blowing out of the suitcase, just hundreds of dollars blowing out in the wind. And he was kneeling before one of the scenes of the Passion, weeping tears. And he found out after this man was a very, a man steeped in deep sins. He was an organizer of prostitution. And stopping to see our Lord's suffering moved him by grace. And he just fell to his knees, dropping his money bag, and wept tears, tears of contrition. So that's the power of, of our Lord's grace. This is what he wants from all of us. Because all of us are guilty. We all have his blood on our hands. We have all spit on him, whipped him, put crown of thorns on him. We were there by our sins. So let's turn to the Virgin Mary. Her, her tender and immaculate heart will teach us how to love our Lord. Many of us, we say we love our Lord, but, but we have to still learn how to love him for real. With our whole heart, with our whole soul, with our whole mind, our whole being. And we don't know how to do it. We've got to learn from our mother how to do it. We have to sit on her lap, like children do on their mother's lap, to learn how to pray. Learn how to see the cross. And we got to humble ourselves like that and sit on the lap of Our Lady and say, Mother, Blessed Mother, teach me how to love our Lord the way you did. Move my heart to love our Lord with contrition, with love, with gratitude, with an eagerness to please and glorify Him and to detest all that offends Him and to imprint on the three children of Fatima the horrors of what sin really is and what it, can, what it leads to, which is the eternal fires of hell. The children of Fatima describe the, the, the loss of equilibrium. There's no stable ground. There's burning. They're burning inside out. The screaming and the, sh the shrieks of despair some priests, when they bring Holy Communion or visit the psych wards of a hospital, they get cold chills, they get goosebumps from the, the uh, inhuman cries and the inhuman shrieks that sometimes you hear that just don't sound natural. And that's just in you know people who have lost their mind. But what about people... Who, who have full use of their reason, but in seeing that they've wasted and thrown away heaven for some few pleasures and vanities and maybe money or whatever, threw away the kingdom of heaven for what? Some cheap mud puddles, toxic mud puddles. And forever in hell they scream, scream and howl and shriek like wild animals at the despair that it was so easy to go to heaven, so easy. And, and, and to show our Lord has really bent over backwards to save us. He became a baby in Bethlehem. He suffered all his life, poverty, hunger, thirst. The three years of his public life, preaching, he walked over 10,000 miles, our Lord, easily 10,000, well more than that. But and then he established 
the seven sacraments, which is the, the outpouring of the love of the Sacred Heart of Jesus all over the world through his bride, the Catholic Church. He established the sacrifice of the Mass the night before he would be crucified. And he told the apostles, do this Mass, say it, offer this sacrifice. Hoc facite, do this action until the end of the world. And our Lord stays with us in the Blessed Sacrament. He washes away our sins with his tears and blood and confession, strengthens us to pray and to grow in manhood in the spiritual life, that is, to be worthy to pray the Mass with the priest, to be worthy to fight for our Lord and defend the kingship of Christ, and to promote and, and fight and push for it. The United States, it's not Republicans and Democrats that are going to save this country. It's going to be a Catholic party, a third party on its own, that proclaims the kingship of Christ and will not compromise with liberalism. There will be the true political solution for the United States. Because Republicans and Democrats are just one side of the same coin. And the, in the, the Red Sea pedestrians just play this constantly. And they own the country and run the whole policies anyway. So break out of these chains. Free ourselves from this. And Catholics have to promote a Catholic country, the reign of the Sacred Heart of Jesus over this country, with no compromise with error, no compromise with liberalism, and the Freemasons will scream and howl, oh, you're unpatriotic, this is not American. But there's no one more American or Canadian than those who love their country in the right way, which is the reign of Christ the King. We could say Canada in the U.S., unlike Europe, Europe was baptized Catholic and was raised Catholic, and now in their old age betray the Catholic faith by apostasy. But America and Canada were raised, were baptized Catholic, but were raised Protestant, if we can compare it that way. South America was baptized Catholic and raised Catholic, and now they're also turning their back on the faith. But they still have a great devotion to Our Lady of Guadalupe, Our Lady of Las Lajas in Colombia, Our Lady of Quito in Ecuador. So there's still a burning fire of love for Our Lady. And also in Portugal, and in, in, uh, in Fatima and uh, some parts of the shrines in Europe. So the real solution is the reign of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And this is what we must promote. This is what we must fight for. This is why we're confirmed, strengthened by the Holy Ghost, to work for this, to reestablish the reign of Christ the King in the way the church has always done it. The large Catholic family, the, the cities centered around the altar, monasteries, convents, seminaries forming real, true, traditional priests, as Archbishop Lefebvre wanted, that were counter-revolutionary and not liberal, and making peace with modernist Rome and shaking hands with modernism, the modernist mass. But those who really fight wholeheartedly for the reign of Christ the King, like all the saints in St. Alphonsus, so the heart of Jesus, he pours himself out excessively, excessively. Look on the cross, he gave the last drops of blood that he had in his body. He couldn't give any more blood than what he gave. It's the love letter, says St. Augustine, written on the paper of the wood of the cross. The ink is his blood. The letter is, it shouts the love of of God, the love of the Holy Trinity, the love of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, the love of the Immaculate Heart of Mary for souls, for our souls, for my soul. And that's the love our Lord has for each soul. So what could be more rude, what could be more heartless and cold than to not return love for love? St. Augustine says that, Lord, you gave your whole life for me, and I won't give my life back to you. That's so unfair. That's coldness. You, the infinite God, in my little stony heart, can't love you. So that's why we want to pray, Lord, take away my heart of stone. 
Replace it with a heart of flesh that burns with love for thee. And if we don't live by love, we'll live by passions of hate, anger, revenge, lust, pride, avarice, malice. We're going to burn in something. As T.S. Eliot said in one of his poems, all of us will burn in this life. We're going to either burn with the fire of the love of God and in heaven enjoy the eternal flame of God who is a burning fire of charity, as St. Paul says, or we will burn with the passions of lust, anger, hate, envy, whatever it is, and without the love of God, our hearts grow stone cold and we will forever burn in the flames of hell. But we make that choice now. The choice is now. And we got to make it now. Don't be those, as St. Alphonsus says in many of his sermons, don't be one of those who delay conversion, delay confession, delay coming back to the heart of Jesus, because you might not see tomorrow, and who promises you to see tonight? So we must take the carpe diem seriously. Seize this day to come to our Lord. And that's a great example of the great soldier of the early church. He was a Roman soldier, St. Expeditus. He saw the martyrs being put to death, fed to the lions, and he saw girls of a tender age, 12, 13, 15, beautiful teenage and young women being torn up by lions. And while they're being torn up by lions, they're praying and forgiving their enemies. And St. Expeditus, he said, I, this is the true religion. It has to be. Only the true religion, only the true God can give such strength even to girls. And he, he's pictured, his statue is often pictured in painting where he's holding a cross. And on it it says, Hodie. And at his foot, he's stepping on a crow. And the crow, when you hear the crows fly, they, they sound like they're saying, Craw, craw. Cross, which in Latin, cross, means tomorrow. Tomorrow, because St. Expeditus' buddies were telling him, oh, just wait another day. Don't, be, don't become a Catholic today. We got a party to go to. Don't go become a Catholic today. Don't be baptized. Just, you got to live, live your life first. Have a little more fun, and then do the serious stuff later. But he was moved by the Holy Ghost and he stood, he steps on the crow, steps on his head, who's saying tomorrow, delay your conversion tomorrow, be baptized tomorrow. He steps on it and holds the cross and it says, Hodie, today I be baptized. And he did just that. He, he listened, he didn't listen to his fake friends and he sought out the Catholic priests and they led him to one of the bishops in the catacombs, and he was baptized, he made his first communion, and he was put to death shortly after for professing the Catholic faith, because he would not burn incense to the gods of Rome. So the gods of our day that we cannot burn incense to are the New Mass, Vatican II, Religious Liberty, the Goddess of Liberty, and, and also the Goddess of Safety. That's one of the goddesses of today. Everyone's all worried about safety, safety, safety. The public schools are so safe, the kids are choking with safety. No toxic air, no carbon monoxide. The fire, the fire system is so fancy and so technological that if, if a kid even lights a flame, the, the alarms will go off and the fires station will come running to rescue the kids from danger of fire, earthly fire, but yet these same rotten public schools and rotten Navasoto schools and rotten universities are teaching the modern rotten philosophies of Immanuel Kant, Hegel, Descartes, Marx, Karl Marx, Hume, and in the Catholic universities they're teaching uh, Immanuel Kant, they're teaching the modernist philosophies that were all condemned by St. Pius X, Teilhard, Father Teilhard de Chardin, Evolution, Karl Rahner, Sheila Becks, Cardinal Ratzinger, 
And Carlo Ratzinger loved the modernists. One of his heroes was Carl Rahner. And he sat with him at Vatican II in their shirt and tie when they should have been in their cassocks. So St. Pius X, he, all this. So the, the faith is a victory over the world. Let's profess it and let's raise high the heart of Jesus on our flags against all the winds. And this was what the great Anacleto Gonzalez Flores, who was martyred in Mexico during the Cristero persecutions, he says in one of his letters, the politics, what we fight for, is the politics of the sacred heart of Jesus, of the reign of the heart of Jesus. Let us raise this flag high, hold it high, and hold it against all the winds, the winds of communism, liberalism, false modern democracy, and all the errors of the modern world, hold it high. Because in the end, it's Christ who has the victory and the Immaculate Heart of Mary. It has given him all power in heaven on earth to judge the living and the dead. Yes, Jesus Christ the King will judge the poor old Joe Biden. He will judge Vladimir Putin. He will judge Donald Trump. He will judge Hillary Clinton. He will judge all these phonies and all these pretenders and all these slaves of the Zionists and the, and the Freemasons. He will judge all of them. He will judge Pope Francis, frightening thoughts. He's already judged Pope Benedict, frightening thought. And John Paul II, frightening thought. He will judge us also. No man will escape the judgment of Jesus Christ. So let's not wait for then to hear an angry judge. Let's love him now, who loves us now. This is the time of mercy. And he really loves each soul, really, as a loving and tender father. What more proof could he give than what he does on the letter of the cross? O oh, Mary, conceived without sin. O oh, Mary, conceived without sin. O oh, Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us forever. And for those who do not have recourse to thee, especially all communists and Freemasons and other enemies of Holy Mother Church, amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.